What's up, Internets? It's Tobin. This is Fuzzy Tolerance Screencast number 22, and I'm going to be doing my HTML5 talk from the North Carolina GIS Conference 2013. And I'm just doing these talks again on here uh, for conferences I've gone to. Just because my slideshows are either non-existent or egregiously unuseful, so unless you actually hear them, uh, they're not going to do you any good at all. And there are legitimate reasons not to come hear me talk. Uh, it could be, could be you were having a baby, or your significant other one was having a baby, or your appendix burst, there was an extinction level event, or perhaps there was something good on television. There are reasons not to come hear me talk, legitimate reasons. So in case you missed it, here's the talk. Now, a little bit about the conference itself. It is one of the best conferences I go to. It's uh, every other year. The folks that uh, organize the conference are great. They're never allowed to retire ever. And uh, like we had over a thousand people at a state GIS conference. A thousand people. Most state GIS conferences, if they have them, might get you know a hundred, two hundred people. A thousand people. We get people from all over the place, from outside the state, and some really great speakers. And the other thing about the conference is, one of the things that makes it different is they have a program committee that comes up with what they want to hear at the conference. And then they just start cold calling people and asking them to come present on those subjects. So most conferences uh, you know, have a, a call for abstracts. These guys just call you and go, hey, Tobin, come talk about HTML5. And they say it in that voice, so you can't really say no. So I did a talk on HTML5 at the conference. You know who else was talking during my session? Douglas Crockford. Douglas Crockford. The man has a Wikipedia page, Douglas Crockford. Things he've done, things he's done, have their own Wikipedia pages, Douglas Crockford. If you, if you, that name isn't familiar to you, he's like a JavaScript luminary. He made Jason. You ever use Jason? He, that, that was him. J.S. Lint, J.S. Mint. That was him. So they were like, can you do a talk on HTML5? Sure. Oh, by the way, you're going to be talking with uh, Douglas Crockford. And I was like, wow. Uh, I'm not sure how my name gets, gets anywhere near his name uh, on a conference schedule. But anyway, he gave a talk in the session to a super nice guy. Uh, and a really good speaker. And if you're new to JavaScript, and if you haven't heard of Douglas Crockford, you're new to JavaScript, uh, check out his book, uh, JavaScript, The Good Parts. It is the best book on any programming language I've ever read. It's super small and just tells you exactly what you need to know and nothing else. Anyway, let's get to the talk. And I did this whole talk in HTML5. This is using reveal.js in a browser. This front slide, because uh, people ask me about this afterward, this is just all CSS. That's a CSS animation. HTML5 for cross-platform development. Now, this session I was giving this talk in was called, uh, you know, frameworks and toolkits, and for GIS web developers, that really consists of HTML5 and JavaScript, Flash, and Silverlight. So, let me get this out of the way right at the start. Don't use Flash or Silverlight ever again. Stop it. It's not bad enough for you that uh, Microsoft and Adobe are running away from these platforms so fast. It's like their rear ends are on fire. These are dead platforms. Most analysts predict sometime in the next two years we will cross a threshold where more than half the users to your typical website won't be coming from a desktop browser. They'll be coming from phones and tablets and other mobile devices. This is what your Flash and Silverlight maps look like on a mobile device. If you're writing applications, more than half your people, half your customers can't use. You might suck a little bit. So, HTML5 is quickly becoming your only choice for GIS development cross-platform on the web. The good news is, 
is in almost all use cases, it is your best choice. There's never been a better time to make it. <laughs> Could you hear that? My cats are throwing crap around the room. Uh, HTML5, the browsers have never been better. The toolkits have never been better. The workflows have never been better. It is a very exciting time to be an HTML5 developer. So what is HTML5? I don't know. There's an HTML5 specification at the W3C that covers a specific set of markup and API. But the common language usage of HTML5 has become that and all kinds of other new -y open web technologies. Things like are often associated with HTML5, uh, like uh, GIS people say it whenever they use JavaScript, even though their maps are generally just bottomless pits of divs. Uh, APIs like geolocation, storage API, web sockets, web workers. None of that's part of HTML5. Box shadows and border, border radiuses and text shadows and animations and responsive web design media queries. None of that's part of HTML5. Even the W3C is just terrible at this. They released their HTML5 logo and said this represents things like SVG, CSS, and WAF. None of which are part of the HTML5 specification. So when I say HTML5 here, what I mean is the HTML5 specification and the new e open web technologies associated with it. With one hard and fast rule, your doc type must look like this. If your doc type looks like anything else, you're doing it wrong. So this talk is really for developers and there are mostly developers in the audience and developers are a pessimistic lot by nature so I wanted to start out with how HTML5 is going to screw you and when a web developer talks about getting screwed they're usually talking about web browsers when a web developer is talking about getting screwed by web browsers they're usually talking about Internet Explorer now let's give Microsoft some credit. They are a lot better than they used to be. They still lag behind all the other modern browsers in terms of HTML5 feature support, both on the desktop and mobile space. They are this trailing line at the bottom in both these charts. But they're catching up, and they are a lot better with Internet Explorer 9 and 10 than they used to be. Gone are the days when you would develop your site in Chrome and Firefox and then pull it up in Internet Explorer and wail in horror at what Microsoft had done. Generally, things just work these days, and that's awesome. But the problem is old Internet Explorer. Most browsers are what they call evergreen these days, which means they mostly take care of updating themselves. Internet Explorer is not evergreen. It is ever old. There is an upgrade system through Microsoft Updates, if that isn't broken, but there's also a mechanism for corporations to turn that off, and they all do. Now, this is one of my babies in January uh, in the Internet Explorer version. We're just going to pretend like we don't see six. We're just going to hope that those are bots with their user agent set to six and not human beings. But Internet Explorer 7... Still, it's 2006 when Internet Explorer came out. There was no iPhone in 2006. No one had heard of Justin Bieber in 2006. Pluto was still a planet in 2006. This is not the way the world should work, but it does. Here's what you can do about it. Some features will degrade nicely, uh, particularly designy type stuff like box shadows and border radiuses and uh, designy animations and responsive design. Old IE won't see those things and you probably just don't care. Some things you can polyfill for, like semantic HTML5 elements, header, footer, aside. Old Inner Explorer doesn't understand what those are. But you can use a polyfill, and a polyfill is just a hack to get a non-supported feature in a browser to kind of work. Uh, there's a polyfill called HTML5 shiv that makes all that stuff work perfectly in old Internet Explorer, so semantic tags will work just fine. 
Some things you can just hide if they're not core features. Uh, like the geolocation, your Where's Waldo button. If that's not a core feature, it's just kind of an extra. Uh, first, you should probably just get rid of it. But if you're not going to do that, you can have detect whether the user's browser supports geolocation API. And if it doesn't, you can set display none on your Where's Waldo button and no one's the wiser. But eventually and inevitably, you will end up here. The browser upgrade notice, the bar of shame. You must be at least this tall to ride this ride. Now this is YouTube, the most popular site, one of the most popular sites on the internet. They make money through advertising, so they like for people to come there. They have an upgrade bar, an upgrade notification. You can do this too. You won't go to hell for this. I've had this on a number of sites in Mecklenburg. I've never received a complaint. Because here's the thing. People aren't on Internet Explorer 7 because they like it. They're on Internet Explorer 7 because they don't know they're on Internet Explorer 7. So consider this a public service. And it's a particularly effective one because you'll have an upgrade link there and people on Internet Explorer 7 will click on almost anything. And for this battle with browsers you're going to have to fight, get to know Modernizer. Modernizer is a tiny JavaScript library that runs a bunch of customizable uh, unit tests, essentially, to determine what browser supports and what it doesn't. And if it supports something, you can turn left. If it doesn't, you can turn right. You can also bundle it with HTML5 shiv, which is very handy. Modernizer comes bundled with things like HTML5 boilerplate, and a lot of sites use it these days. Get to know Modernizer. Now we're going to look at some HTML5 stuff that I thought might be particularly useful. It is a very tiny list. There are lots of stuff I could have talked about and I just don't have time for. Some of this stuff you can use today. Some of it you can use later on. And this is a thing you can use today and it's boring so I'll talk about it quickly. We used to do layout with divs and we'd say div id equals header, div id equals footer, div id equals nav, div id equals whatever you were calling your sidebar that week. And divs are non-semantic. They have no meaning. It's basically just a generic block level element. Now we have semantic HTML5 elements to cover this kind of basic layout. Header and nav and articles and asides and sections and footers and and figures and fig captions h groups you can go ahead and use these right now and you really should it'll make writing and reading your code much easier it'll make support down the road much easier html5 shiv works perfectly for old internet explorer go ahead and use this now responsive design or responsive web design or rwd if you just have to turn everything into an acronym this is basically a way to get the browser to re or the, your site to react to the user's browser environment. So it uses, works by CSS media queries, and you can restyle and redesign your site to work better whether the device is a full-size 1080p desktop or a mobile phone. Basically, you can write your site once and have it run anywhere. No snarky references to Java, please. It's only supported by IE9 or higher um, in terms of Internet Explorer. It's supported by everything else. It's not a really great polyfill for it, but since no one's rocking IE7 on their phone, you probably don't care. Media queries are very simple. Uh, you can set min and max widths to capture ranges or just set a max width to say anything below the size do this. You can also do things like specify the media is only for the screen or print or what have you and you can make your styling specific to the orientation for a device now pro tip if you've done a really good best practices type design in your html media queries for responsive design will be extremely easy very simple if you haven't done a great job there it will be extraordinarily difficult and if you find yourself writing hundreds of lines of, in your media queries to scale down to a phone, 
you really need to go back and look at your original HTML layout and design and figure out how you can do that better. End of pro tip. Couple of quick examples. Uh, let me jump back out of here. Here's uh, the world's uh, most loved GIS blog. It's followed by dozens. Um, this has the world's most simplest responsive design. That sidebar is not going to work great on a phone in portrait mode. It's going to take up too much space. You won't be able to read anything. So as your browser narrows down, it jumps to the top. That CSS responsive design, that media query is like three lines. And that's it. That's how simple responsive design can be. It's also doing some other tricks like this image you see here. As we scale down, it will shrink that. So you're not getting all kinds of yucky. Uh, uh, horizontal scrolling is like the root of all evil. So you don't want that. Very simple responsive design. Our quality of life dashboard, which we just launched in January, has a more complicated responsive design. But again, it's not very much code. This is using Twitter's bootstrap for its, some, of it, some of the responsiveness. And see, as we shrink down, the content will actually shrink down in a couple stages. If we shrink down to the next stage, you'll notice this search bar, this whole top bar will get reduced. Did my phone just seriously ring? Hang on a second. Oh, I'm back. That was actually my door, UPS guy. So, so if you needed proof that I'm not a robot and, and, and these are actually live recorded, <laughs> you got it. All right, this top bar, as you shrink down, you'll watch it'll go from this layout to your more traditional, if I can grab this, uh, three bar horizontal line, push me with your fingers kind of mobile thing. And as it goes even further, it'll go to a single column layout with some animation down to the map. So that is a more complicated responsive design. But responsive design, again, it is made to sound much harder than it is. It's actually pretty straightforward. Geolocation API, your where's Waldo button. Geolocation uses uh, a number of different techniques to figure out where the user is. Can use IP address, a wireless network location, uh, near cell tower. The device has a GPS built in, like a phone. It can use that too. So it can range. The accuracy ranges a lot. Now it's Internet Explorer nine above for IE. There's a polyfill for it that works kinda, uh, sorta, <laughs> probably good enough. Geolocation API is very straightforward. Navigator, geolocation, get current position. You can also do watch position if you've got po some poor intern slogging up a creek bed with their phone recording data, hopefully in a Ziploc baggie. Um, you can get watch position. And it'll re basically you can give it a happy function, a things went terrible function, and some optional parameters. Your happy function will receive a position uh, object with a number of elements. You get the latitude longitude. You can get altitude. You will get a report of the vertical and horizontal accuracy in meters. So you'll be able to tell. Uh, you may only want to provide this function if their accuracy is, say, greater than 100 meters. So you can do that kind of detection. I'll just see how that works. We'll go back to this quality of life dashboard. Here's a where's Waldo button. You say, where am I? Say, there you are. And that's pretty, pretty much basically all that does. Now, the first time a user clicks on the geolocation API in their browser, it's going to say, hey, do you want the uh, creepy lady or guy who made this website to know where you are? And they have to allow that to happen. So that's why you have that, uh, uh, you know, it's not something you can rely on all the time. All right. Next, SVG, Scalable Vector Graphics. This is actually a very old thing. It's been around for a long time. There's like some hot drama between Microsoft and, and the W3C and 
Microsoft took its ball and went home and called its ball VML. And nobody else used that. And with IE9 and higher, they're now using SVG. There's a polyfill for SVG that supports some SVG features, but not all. SVG is an XML format, so go ahead and let that burn in your throat for a minute. Uh, and it's a very featureful format. There are lots of primitives. There's lots of different ways to draw, draw different types of shapes. There's gradients and shadows and all kinds of stuff. So it's not something you really want to make by hand unless it's extraordinarily simple. If you're looking for a good desktop SVG editor, Inkscape is free, open source, and awesome. Now, for these examples, they're all using a library called D3, or Data Driven Documents. It's a JavaScript library that uses SVG for data visualization. It's not a GIS thing, it's a data visualization thing that can also do some mapping stuff. And it is really super awesome. Coropleth, it just made every, uh, these are all vectors and it's every county in the US that fast. And it's all open web standards. So when you style your SVG, you can use CSS. And this bit of JavaScript right here does that whole thing. D3 is really simple to use. It loads the vectors from uh, probably from TopoJSON. But yeah, it's probably TopoJSON, which I'll talk about more in a minute. And it's loading the data from this comma column delimited file rather. Just this little bit of code. I mean that whole chloropath map. Very pretty. Cartograms. Everyone loves cartograms. Now here's where I'll talk about TopoJSON. You've probably heard of GeoJSON, which is really just JSON with a particular schema for uh, GIS stuff. TopoJSON kind of harkens back to ArcInfo coverages in that there is implied topology in the data itself. So coincident geometry on polygons is stored once. With a shapefile or GeoJSON or, or a lot of modern GIS formats, these two polygons would store this coincident line two times. Now we score it once. Not only does that greatly reduce the size, it also allows you to do topologic type stuff without bad things creeping in. Like here, this, these are all vectors. And you can see these are vectors because we can hover over each one as a feature and see this bit of information. We'll, on the fly, in an animated way, make these into cartograms. Now this isn't going back to the server saying, hey, give me some silly image of this cartogram after you chew on it for a while. This is all done client side, right in the, bar right in the browser with D3. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. All right, let's look at one more of these. New York Times electoral map. This was a really awesome use of D3 and a really great visualization. Uh, you probably saw it uh, during the last presidential election. See, this is all D3 and SVG. We can hover over these. And this will highlight these features over here. Over here, these are squares, and they're proportionally sized based on the number of electoral college votes, and they're colored based on the way they're leaning. As we go to a different visualization, it's just using these same, same shapes and converting them into different shapes and moving them around. Normally, this is something you'd have some ugly plug-in like Flash or Silverlight, something to do this. This is all D3 JavaScript and SVG. See, we hover over these to get information. These are also interactive parts of your DOM because they're just SVG. So we can drag this to the undecided and change the totals. That is a great use of D3 and is really interesting intuitive visualization. So those are all using SVG, using D3 to do that. SVG is something you can probably use now. Canvas. Canvas, think of this like a square in your web browser you can draw stuff on. 
The difference between it and SVG is SVG adds things to your DOM. That gives you the advantage in terms of their actual DOM elements that persist and can be manipulated in the client side. But because they're DOM elements, you can't add too many of them without really affecting performance. Like you couldn't add a million, uh, a SVG with a million features in it. It would just, that would just, that would be all kinds of ugly. Canvas renders as a bitmap, so it is very suitable for large numbers of features or whether it's very fast motion, like in if you're making a game or something. That's what you use it for. Now it's Internet Explorer 9 or greater. There are some polyfills for it, but they don't support all Canvas features. Canvas is an is a HTML element just called Canvas. You get the 2D context of it and you can start drawing. There's not a lot of primitive shapes in Canvas. There's like a rectangle and that's about it. Everything else you're drawing by hand, you want really want a library to take that kind of lifting off your hands for you. Some examples of that. Heat map. We've all had this experience where a client has said, you know, I've got these continuous data collection points, rain gauges or stream gauges or air pollution monitors or whatever. Hey, I want to make a, you know, a raster of this kind of heat map on my website for the current stuff. And you go, great, well, I'm going to have to go to the server, take the data, make a raster of that on the fly, which is only good for that particular second, and then carve that up into, you know, pings and then ship it back to the client. By then, the by then, the person has left and gone to Twitter and basically said various permutations of you suck. So now we've got a whole bunch of random data points. We'll go heat map. And this is doing it in Canvas directly in the browser. There is no round trip back to the server. It is just taking that data and making that Canvas as a bitmap quickly and easily in the browser. That's a very good example of Canvas and how it can be used to do really cool things. GIS. OSM Buildings is an interesting use of Canvas. See this building here? I see you. That kind of parallax 3D perspective is done with Canvas. Look at this other area with more buildings. Now Google do, does something like this in WebGL, but Canvas is actually is probably a little bit faster. And you just see how nice that works. This is using OpenStreetMap buildings and elevations. The whole JavaScript library for this, it's a leaflet extension. It's like, uh, yeah, right here. It's under 10K to do that. How awesome is that? How awesome is that? You could probably color those different things for different use types and show those in a, a 2.5D, pardon me, uh, Jekylls. Uh, type of interface. Very interesting use of Canvas. This is what I'm talking about for Canvas. This is a GIS cloud that kind of blew everybody's brains when they came out with this. This is over 2 million line features drawn using Canvas. And this is one of the things Canvas is going to be really good for is drawing huge amounts of features. They probably can't see but it's actually highlighting each little line as I pass over it. You can click and identify stuff, you know, and zoom in. And this is this is Canvas doing this, and it's extraordinarily quick for two million features. Next, WebGL probably shouldn't use this yet. Almost nothing supports it. Microsoft has actually said we will never support this because we're very concerned about security uh, now. Uh, and they have some security concerns that are mostly not really, they, they really just don't want you running games in a browser. They want you buying Windows to do that. WebGL is a 3D and 2D interactive extension for Canvas that can use GPU acceleration. And you can do very uh, interactive type environments things that you just have to see to understand because you can almost do anything you can think of 
like things you'd see in a video game or things you would see done through Flash or Silverlight, you can do in WebGL. Not a polyfill for it, no mobile support. I think with Google Chrome Beta, if you rooted your device, you can set a flag to enable it. It could be, it seems like I've heard that, but I haven't tried it. Just get your canvas element, and here we're getting the experimental WebGL uh, context of it instead of the 2D context, and from there the code gets extraordinarily ugly. A couple quick examples of that. Look at Emoti Globe. This one's kind of neat. Emoti Globe uh, essentially looks at uh, the planet's emotional state. It uses Twitter and looks for happy and sad words. And uh, if it's mostly happy words, you get a green line for that area. If it's mostly sad, you get a red. And the size of the line is the intensity of the feelings. So up here in our normally stoic New England people, they've been very, very happy ever since the Super Bowl. I'm not sure, sure how that happened. And interestingly, so I've looked at this site a number of times. This little province, Providence, whatever, over here in India, they're just always riled up and pissed off about something. I have to like, I wonder what they're mad about. I don't know. This is a very interesting use of WebGL, is in this, this uses uh, cesium. And this is a Global Hawk Surveillance Drone Path. Probably not a real one, this is just a demo. You can watch it as it goes through its flight and its different surveillance turns. You can see with the different sensors it's using in these cones exactly what area it's covered. And then in the sky you can see like the GPS satellite locations and stuff. So this is like almost a very interactive movie type experience. So as we get more 3D data, like uh, LiDAR comes to mind, because uh, I dealt with that recently, and that's just hard data to deal with. Um, this uh, WebGL is going to become really interesting, the GIS applications of it. Web workers, think of these like uh, background JavaScript processes. Uh, every device now almost is like a multi-core device. Even phones come with, I don't know if you can hear my cat meowing at me. I'll feed you next week. Go kill something. Uh, even phones are like, you can get like quad-core phones now. I don't know what you do with that, but. WebWorker is a background JavaScript process. And it doesn't work in Android at all for some reason. Internet Explorer 10 or higher, so it's probably not something you want to use now. The only polyfill for it is really to run the JavaScript you were going to run as a worker back in synchronous mode. And if that was really practical, you probably wouldn't have done it in a web worker. Now we do some complicated things in GIS on the client end, and it would be nice to have them run in the background sometimes, so you're not locking up the whole interface. Here's what the controller looks like. You just establish a new web worker, which is probably a JavaScript file. You add a listener, so your worker can send messages back to your controller. And you can post messages to your worker to tell it to start doing stuff. Here I'm sending text. You can send JSON there as well. Your worker, you listen to uh, messages from the controller. We'll get that message say start. You can go run this code. You can get a message say stop to stop whatever you're doing. And here's an example. Here we're going to make an extremely complicated route that would normally lock your whole JavaScript interface up for a long, long time. Like once we start loading route, normally that would be game over. You would have to go dig your map loading uh, animated GIF from 2001 and throw it on the site somewhere. Here, the whole time it was doing that, let me run that again because I was jabbering, everything still works. This is running in a, essentially a background process, so you're not tying up the whole interface while this thing runs. And as we do more and more complicated things in the client for GIS stuff, web workers are going to become more and more important. Some things to think about. 
First, think about Web Mercator, as in, if there is not a compelling reason to, uh, there has to be a really compelling reason not to use Web Mercator. Really, really compelling. Use Web Mercator, your life will just be a lot easier. It's what people are used to seeing on the web. Sure, if you live in the North Pole, I know Web Mercator looks like shit. Use something else there. Otherwise, just use Web Mercator. You're, trust me, you'll thank me. Uh, it's really hard. Everything is so fluid. Like D3, I hadn't even heard of a couple of months ago. It's really hard to predict winners and losers in the JavaScript library space. But if I had to predict a couple of winners, things to really keep your eye on, it'd be D3 and Leaflet. D3, we took a look at Leaflet's just kind of everywhere. They're both getting a lot of interest and growing very quickly. I would keep my eyes on those two. Another big thing to keep an eye on in the GIS space is use of vectors over rasters for a lot of use cases. A lot of GIS on the web is really just a raster with a, a marker on it for a vector. We're going to start moving more and more toward actual interactive vectors as part of our maps. Where we're, we're drawing layers from vectors, not as PNG overlays. As such, things like topo JSON are going to become much more important. Data reduction will become very important. Topo JSON is a way you get there. Uh, you can also you should do smart things like when you make your GeoJSON file or KML file, don't store your lat longs with like 35 significant digits. I don't care what you're doing. Your data is just not that accurate. Mobile first. This is a design philosophy GIS people really need to embrace. And not just for practical terms and that mobile device is becoming more popular. It's an approach to web design. Whereas what we do mostly now is start out with a 1080p screen and then kind of scrunch it down to a phone. The idea here is you start with a phone and then you expand. And this forces you to think about your key core minimum shipping functionality. Your, your minimum uh, uh, it's minimum viable product is what they call it in the literature. And that's really important for GIS folks because we make some of the biggest, slowest, ugliest, bloatiest, button-filled horrors of web design uh, in the entire world. So mobile first approach is a good way to combat that. Something I, I really recommend. Modern web development workflow. You can still do all this stuff with just a text editor, and that's not even a bad way to go. Text editor is still extremely important. If you're not passionate about your text editor, find one you're very passionate about. I won't tell you what the right answer is there because text editors are a very personal thing, but the right answer is Sublime Text too. But we have had this renaissance of uh, web development workflow and tooling that we just haven't had. And it's all in the last few years. Now this is a this this is an image that Paul Irish did, which I stole. Uh, you generally don't want to start from a blank canvas anymore. You start with a good boilerplate. HTML5 boilerplate is a great place to start. You're not necessarily authoring in HTML and CSS and JavaScript anymore. You don't have to. You can use SAS and Compass and less, SAS and less really, Compass is kind of a eh, SAS thing, but you can use those to write CSS where you'll get some things like uh, variables and mix-ins and some object-oriented -y kind of stuff. You can do markdown for simple HTML. If uh, you're coming from Python and a C-influenced language like JavaScript makes you want to kill yourself, you can try looking at CoffeeScript. You're using frameworks like uh, you could be using MV, MVC framework like uh, uh, Backbone, or you could be using AMD framework like uh, Response.js, using jQuery UI, and just all kinds of frameworks. Iteration workflow. That's like where you hit Control S, and then you F5 on your browser, and say, damn, and just do that again and again and again all day long, because that's what a web developer does for a living. 
Now you have all these iteration workflow tools. You use Live Reload. So as you change your code, it just appears in the browser right next to your code window all by itself. Just not hitting F5 is like, it's just a dramatic quality of life improvement. You've got all kinds of great developer tools. You got JS Hint. You should be running JS Hint all the time when you do JavaScript. You got performance tuning. Chrome development tools are, are really great for that. Build and optimization, minifying your code, concatenating your code, optimizing your images. You got deployment hooks in Git. So when you're checking to master it, can deploy to your site. This whole bunch of tooling and web development workflow has really changed and become a lot better and, and a lot more complicated in the last few years. What I suggest you start with is Yeoman. Yeoman is an opinionated workflow tool and it incorporates elements from all of this. And opinionated just means that they, they picked what they thought was good and rolled with that. And I, I think they picked really good things. It's done by Paul Irish and Adi Osmani and some other folks. Uh, Paul and Adi are from Google really good it's command line driven has live reload it comes with its own http server um, command line driven again so go ahead and freak out about that but it's, it's fairly straightforward get to know yeoman it's a good place to start if you're just getting into these modern web development workflows and that was my talk and it seemed to go well there there were no underpants thrown so there's there's no litmus test but it seemed to go pretty well and i hope you enjoyed that there was so much, I mean, you could only spend days, you can have a whole conference just on HTML5. So I really just picked a few things. I didn't talk about web sockets. I didn't talk about Flexbox. I didn't talk about Shadow DOM. I didn't talk about so many things. So if there is any other HTML5 stuff you're interested in or, or you've read about and you're having a hard time wrapping your head around, just shoot me an email or or tweet me or Google plus me or whatever you want to do to me. And, and I'd be happy to talk about those things. So that was my talk. Hope you enjoy up oh, wrong button. That was my talk. I hope you enjoyed that. And, uh, I will see you next month. Next month. What I think I'm going to do is talk about, uh, yeoman, maybe do a, a like, a quick tutorial on getting that up and running and using it in live reload just to see I think a lot of GIS web developers really haven't embraced the whole web development workflow set of tools that they can that's out there right now because we're we're generally GIS people first and developers second and we tend to lag behind by a year or two and there's some really cool stuff out there you can do now that's probably what I'm going to take a look at. But again, I'll forget I said that in about 15 minutes, and there's no telling what I'll talk about. Uh, I will see you next month. Bye-bye.